Comics Plus, what is going on? My name is Aka Sun, and it's time for us to uh, here at Comics Plus to get into that Comics Plus side of what we do. Uh, you know, we we've covered this uh, since it broke a long, long time ago. The Ray Fisher uh, episodes and drama that he's had all across the board with WB. Um, and, um, you know, at the time he had an NDA that he signed, so he couldn't really say much of anything, but he did promise that once that NDA was up, a uh, non-disclosure agreement was up, that he was going to come out and he was going to let everybody know what was going on. And, uh, that day has finally come, actually. That day has finally come. Um... Discussing film, I'm sorry, actually, The Hollywood Reporter actually just dropped that article, like, after talking with him, interviewing him for a few hours, and, you know, the first thing that caught my my eye was off of Discussing Film, and this is just a highlight from this whole article that we're going to read today, right now, uh, live on Twitch, uh, but one of the things that uh, is... Uh, I noticed being put it out there so it would catch everybody's eye is that Joss Whedon threatened to harm Gal Gadot's career on Justice League and disparage Patty Jenkins. One witness says Joss told Gal he's the writer, she's going to shut up and say the lines, and he can make her look incredibly stupid in this movie. Damn. And, you know, what's interesting about this is that Gal has kind of mentioned that she has she has had a problem or she did have a problem with the reshoots of Justice League, but it got resolved. She didn't go into it anymore, but I kind of barely remember mentioning that and then just moving on from that. It's very interesting. Ray, on the other hand, has really taken this up. So um, we're going to... Uh, basically get into this yes sailor stephanie he's the pervy one <laughs> all right let's go let's get into it here we go here we go ray what you got to say all right so ray fisher opens up about justice league joss whedon and warners i don't believe some of these people are fit for leadership over the past year the actor has assailed the filmmaker and studio uh, in harsh but cryptic tweets for what he says was racist and inappropriate conduct. I'm not so indebted to Hollywood that I haven't been willing to put myself out there. Ray Fisher is ready to talk. Ever since June 2020, when he fired off a tweet accusing Joss Whedon of gross, abusive, unprofessional, and completely unacceptable conduct on the set of Justice League, the 33-year-old actor has used social media and a series of interviews to lob serious allegations of racist behavior and a cover-up at Warner Brothers. For Fisher, who plays Cyborg in the film, the issue is no longer so much of what happened on the set in 2017 after direct, director Zack Snyder was replaced by Josh Whedon, though he's ready to explain that too. His unrelenting focus in recent months has been the way the executives first at Warner Film Studio and then, and then at its parent, Warner Media, handled allegations raised by himself and others. <clears throat> Warner Media has previously said that remedial action was taken as a result of its investigation, but has not elaborated. A spokesperson tells The Hollywood Reporter that for privacy and legal reasons, our policy is not to publicly disclose the findings or the results of an investigation. Catherine Forrest, a former federal judge who conducted the Warner probe, tells The Hollywood Reporter in a statement that interviews with more than 80 witnesses, she found no credible support for claims of racial animus or racial insensitivity. A Warner spokesperson 
Oh Oh my god. <laughs> I got turned that off though. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna get it. Uh, okay, I appreciate that. That he said, Do you think it would be better for WB to fully review? Uh, I'll get to that in a little bit. Thank you, Super Sparta, though, for the bits. Um, racial insensitivity. A Warner Media spokesperson notes that the company made extraordinary effort to accommodate Mr. Fisher's concerns about the investigation and to ensure its fullness and fairness and has complete confidence in the investigation process and forces conclusions. Okay, so we've we've already went that direct uh, director uh, uh, direction. We're familiar with that as well. Remedial, like okay, we investigated ourselves, we found ourselves innocent. Yep, that is true. All right. Uh, Fisher was raised by a single mother and his grandmother in Lawside, Jersey. Blah blah da 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 da. Okay, we get it. Fisher is a good guy. I'm not. I'm not belating that point, but we don't need to. We yeah. Just like this part, we're gonna. Uh, Fisher, who had few screenwriters, blah blah da 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 da. Okay, he was mindful. Right, he was mindful that the film was overseen almost entirely by white executives and filmmakers. Yeah, that's okay. Well. Okay, here we go. Hold on. Gotta get some of my tea. <sighs> here we go. While Fisher has dropped details and named names, outsiders have struggled to understand how did Whedon incur his anger? Did Fisher really decline to participate in an investigation that was launched in response to his own complaints? As Warner's claims in September, was Fisher fighting a religious, a righteous battle or a what? Exquatic, exquatic one when he set out on a path that appears to have cost him a place in the DC film universe? Now, in many hours of conversation, Fisher tells his side. Much of his previous reluctance to spell out the story, he says, arose because he didn't, and still doesn't, want to expose the identities of the others who shared their stories with him and investigators. I'm not looking to have any witnesses lose their jobs, he said. says. Those, who, those include some of who wouldn't seem to have any worries about job security. Gal Gadot, Jason Momoa, and Jason Momoa. Others who were not involved with Justice League also spoke to Fisher, and in some cases, the investigators about experiences with Weathen and with Jeff Johns, who was co-chairman of DC Films and a producer on the film. Hmm. They include Charisma Carpenter, Jesus Christ. Oh, God. Who re so this is why. Who recently wrote on social media of Whedon's alleged abusiveness on Buffy the Vampire Slayer and the individuals who had worked with Johns on sci fi's Krypton. Oh, my God. Okay. Fisher got Warner to start an investigation more than two years after the first version of the film was released, but he soon found the process to be suspicious. The studio and its parent company seemed to be focused on protecting top executives, he says. The process moved in, moved in, starts and stops, and when he felt forced to ramp up his public protests, the studio responded with what Fisher calls a deliberate smear. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> um, Warners maintains it has done everything necessary to address Fisher's concerns. He still wants an apology. So I remember this. This was a uh, woof. This was a uh, yep, almost one year ago. This is crazy. I remember waking up. I was butt naked. Saw this tweet. Made a video about it. Let's continue. In May 2017, Fisher was walking into a movie in New York when he got a call from Zack Snyder that left him stunned. Snyder was leaving Justice League. 
citing his daughter's suicide. Sources say Snyder was under enormous pressure at the time. The studio was unhappy with the reception and box office performance of his previous film, The Bleak Batman v Superman, and with Justice League footage already shot, now insisted on a lighter touch. Warners also asked Snyder to produce a two-hour cut that he had wrenching time delivering, though eventually did. Ultimately, Snyder's... Wait, 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 wait. Wait, there's a Snyder cut that's under two hours? I want to see that. I want to I really want to see what the what the Snyder cut was that's 2 hours. That's the one I want to check out. Anyways, ultimately Snyder left and Whedon, who had written and directed Marvel's The Avengers had already been brought in to help brighten Justice League's tone, took the helm. The Justice League that Fisher had signed up was a far cry from the film that Whedon ended up finishing. Snyder had Fisher talk at length with the screenwriter Chris Terrio before there was even a script. Zack and I always considered Cyborg's story to be the heart of the movie, Terrio tells The Hollywood Reporter. He has the most pronounced character arc of any of the heroes, beginning from a place of despair and ending with a feeling that he is whole and that he is loved. And Terriel says that he and Snyder took the portrayal of the first black superhero in the DC film universe very seriously. Adding, with a white writer and a white director, we both thought having the perspective of an actor of color was really important. And Ray is really good with story and character. So he became a partner in creating Victor, referring to the character's given name. When new filming proceeded under Whedon, says Fisher, he came to feel that he had to explain some of the most basic points of what it would be offensive to the black community. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to lie. I believe that. <laughs> Ooh. Is that the two hour, 14 minutes? Really? Hmm. Maybe that's the one that was unwatchable. Yeah, you might be right. Maybe that's the one that's some, I still want to see that one. All right. Uh, after Fisher reps were told that we didn't plan to make more to make major revisions to the film he flew from New Jersey to meet with the filmmaker in LA. When the two met at a bar, Fisher says Whedon was tiptoeing around the fact that everything was changing. As he left the meeting, Fisher was handed the revised script, which he read twice on the plane back. Gone was Cyborg's traumatic backstory, his reputation with his mother, whose loving scenes with her sons were eliminated as was the accident that killed her and led to his transformation. The material that the material was later restored in a Snyder Cut version of the film that was streamed on HBO Max. It represents that his parents are two genius level black people, Fisher says. We don't see that every day. Whedon sent out an email asking for questions, comments, or fulsome praise, but Fisher says it became clear. All he was looking for was some fulsome praise. Trying to strike a jocular tone, Fisher responded that he mourned the loss of the cyborg material, but was moving on. He said that he said that he said he had notes to avoid issues in terms of representation of the character. But in a call with Whedon, Fisher says he had barely started to talk when the filmmaker cut him off. It feels like I'm taking notes right now, and I don't like taking notes from anybody. Not even Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> oh, shit. This is getting good, man. This is getting good. All right. Um... 
<laughs> Other sources on the project say Whedon was similarly dismissive of Gadots and Momoa when they questioned new lines. Whedon declined to comment for this piece. Of course, he, he hasn't said shit in like years now. Um, Fisher turned to Johns, who he says had presented himself as kind of a mediator. But Fisher says his ultimate response was, we can't make Josh mad. Publicist Howard Bragman, <laughs> who represents Johns, denies that but says Johns recalls suggesting that any creative pitches should happen when Whedon was not preoccupied so he would be most receptive. Oh boy. <laughs> Once Whedon got involved, Fisher says that Johns told him, uh, told him, sorry, I'm really thinking about some other stuff now. Fisher says that Johns told him that it was problematic that Cyborg smiled only twice in the movie. Fisher says he later learned from a witness who participated in the investigations that Johns and other top executives, including then DC Films chairman John Berg and Warner Studio chief to Toby Emerch, had discussions in which they said that they could not have an angry black man at the center of the film. Johns, rep, response that once the chairman of the studio mandated a brighter tone for the film all further discussion centered on adding joy and hopefulness to all six superheroes there were always conversations about avoiding any stereotype of race gender or sexuality <laughs> there's walter right there look at that I don't know who those other people are. All right. <sighs> Johns told Fisher he should play the character less like Frankenstein and more like the kind-hearted Quasimodo. <gasps> what? <laughs> They're trying to get this moment <laughs> to be the hunchback of Dr. Dom and Wow. All right. Fisher says that in order to demonstrate the look he wanted, Johns dipped his shoulder in what struck Fisher as a severe, servile posture. Servile. Hey, Siri, define servile. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. I, I figured that's probably what it meant. To be like a slave. Okay, wow. All right. Wow. All right. Um, continuing. To Fisher, there was a big difference between portraying a character who was born with a disability versus one who had been transformed by trauma. Um... And he felt Cyborg was a kind of modern-day Frankenstein. I didn't have any intention of playing him as a jovial, cathedral-cleaning individual, he says. John's representative, rep representative responds, Jeff gave a note using a fictional character as an example of a, of a symp sympathetic man who is unhappy and has an inclination to hide from the world, but one whom the audience roots for because he has a courageous heart. Interesting. Damn, this is actually a pretty good representative. Like, like he knows kind of what to say. All right. Fisher told Johns it might be one thing for a non-black person to write a character for a comic, but it was another for a black actor to portray that character on scr screen. Fair enough. It was like he was assuming how black people would respond rather than taking the advice from the only black person, as far as I know, with any kind of creative impact on the project, Fisher says. Hmm. Fisher says Johns did not yield. That was the last creative conversation about anything that... Je that Jeff Johns and I had. 
I knew I was on my own, Fisher says. John's rep denies that he ever dismissed any comments, adding that Fisher's Fisher knew John's, whose spokesperson requested that he be identified as a Le, as Lebanese American, had evolved traditionally all white DC properties like Shazam, Justice Society of America, and others into diverse groups of heroes in his extensive work as a comic book author. <clears throat> Mm -mm -mm. Uh. Justice League producer Chuck Roven, a veteran on DC superhero films dating back to Batman Begins in 2005, says, I fully emphasize, empathize with Ray that his character arc was significantly altered and shortened. I've also collaborated with Jeff over many years and found him to be a gracious, humble man. Jeff took it upon himself to put Cyborg into Justice League comics in the first place and has written more about the character than any other individual except for the creator. He loves the character Cyborg. You know, I've... Side note, fam. Side note. I've actually talked to Je Jeff a, f uh, a few times. Uh, not in, not so much in, not in deep detail, but before he was like on the Hollywood level that he is, he's at now, um, a lot back in the MySpace days, I sent him a photo of me as a, as a red lantern and blood all down my, th uh, mouth and everything. Uh, if I ever find that photo, I'll send it to, uh, I'll show you guys, but this is like whew, 20 years ago, maybe, maybe. 25 years, uh, 15 years ago. And like, he actually responded back and he was like, man, this is great. I really like it. Like, it's so cool to see, uh, see you doing this. And then my friend, uh, Jonathan Bell, who does, uh, Superman cosplay. Um, Jeff knew, found out about him and the fact that he has like a green lantern tattoo. And he sent like, uh, John, um, uh, he, I'm sorry. He sent he sent my friend like a full package of just Green Lantern gear, comics, all signed and everything. I'm not saying that you know what's ha I'm not uh, belittling what we're reading right here. I'm just saying that so you know my experiences with him and what I've heard about him has been pretty uh, good. But you never know. Hollywood be changing people. Let's keep going. Uh, let's go. Alright. <laughs> maybe Green Lantern blowing it. Maybe, maybe Green, Green Lantern bombing completely changed him. He turned into a Red Lantern. Alright. Let's continue. Uh, whoa, whoa. Okay. All these tensions were playing out during an extremely stressful time at the studio. AT&T's $85 billion acquisition of Time Warner, which was announced in October 2016 but didn't close until June 2018, was still pending. Justice League was at a $300 million, was a $300 million proposition. What the hell? Really? It cost $300 million to originally make Justice League? The first version of it? No. No way! Nah, that can't be right. That has to be with the reshoots. Okay. And it was troubled. Warners had not been able to match Disney's consistent success with Marvel movies. Fisher felt that some of the studio executives' decision-making was driven by fear of losing their jobs. I'm sure it was. The tension only escalated when the issue of having Cyborg say Booyah arose. <laughs> <laughs> let's keep going that phrase had become a signature of the character thanks to the animated Teen Titans shows but the character had never said it in the comics or in the original script really? huh okay 
Fisher says that Johns had approached Snyder about including the line, but the director didn't want any catchphrases. He managed the situation by putting the word on some signs in his version of the film as an Easter egg. But John said the entire studio believed the Booyah line was a fun moment of synergy. Hmm. <laughs> All right, I, I, I got to hear I got I got to hear Ray's thoughts on this because I know he really was upset about this and then you know fans really wanted him to say it um but i knew he really like he talked about it on twitter he had a like he was like why does everybody want me to say this line um so fisher says he doesn't see the word in itself as an issue but he thought it would he thought it played differently in a live action film than the animated series and he thought of black characters in pop culture with defining phrases gary coleman's what you talking about willis jimmy walker's dynamite as no one else in the film had a catchphrase he says it seemed weird to have the only black character say that Hmm. 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 I can I can see I can understand his perspective on that. I can understand his perspective on that. Interesting. Okay. All right. With reshoots underway, Fisher says Whedon raised the issue again. Jeff tells me Cyborg has a catchphrase, he told him. Fisher says he expressed his objections and it seemed the matter was dropped until Berg, the co-chairman of DC Films and a producer on the project, took him to dinner. <laughs> Damn, all this, all this over booyah. Okay. This is one of the most expensive movies Warner's has ever made berg said according to fisher what if the ceo of at&t has a son or a daughter and that son or daughter wants cyborg to say booyah in the movie and we don't have a take of that i could lose my job <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> i'm just imagining these these dudes that are making Millions of dollars a year up here arguing over <laughs> Booyah, man. Come on, man. You gotta say it. You gotta say it. Oh, my God. But, all right, let's keep going. Fisher responded that if he knew he filmed the line, it would end up in the movie. And he expressed skepticism that the film's fate rested on Cyborg saying booyah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You put an entire <laughs> This is so dumb, man. All right. But he shot the take. As he arrived on set, he says, Whedon stretched out his arms and said a line from Hamlet in a mocking tone. Speak the speech. I pray you. As I pronounced it to you, Fisher replied, Josh, don't. I'm not in the mood. As he left the set after saying just that one phrase for the cameras, he says, we didn't call out, nice work, Ray. Fuck, man. Yo. They just need to make a whole movie about the Snyder Cut. I mean, the, about, about, like, I've always said this. I've, I've always, I've always said, like, straight up. Um, I think it was Argo. Yeah, yeah. I think it was Argo. That was somewhat, like, legit. The best DC movie, the best DC movie that Warner Brothers will ever make would be about Warner Brothers trying to make DC movies, man. Like, 
the behind the shit, the behind the scenes shit is more interesting than the actual DC movies at this point. And if you, I think it was Argo. I'm pretty sure it was Argo or the other movie that Ben Affleck was in, um, where he dressed up as Superman. What movie was that? Um, anybody want to help me out there? Um, Ben Affleck dressed up as Superman and, um, something like i think that was also about a movie about behind the scenes at a at a uh uh movie studio i've always thought like um it, they they could make the best story half of them can play themselves in the movie just and that that could be oscar winning material i'm not even i'm not even joking man was that really Arkle? Is the one where Ben Affleck dressed up as Superman? No, he played, um, no, no, no. Ben Affleck played, um, what's his name? Um, George Reeves. I think it was the George Reeves, Reeves story. Yeah, possibly. What was that movie called? Ho Thank you. There you go. Hollywood land. Hollywood land. I'm, I'm pretty sure that was like, when I watched that movie, I'm like, damn, dude, if they ever made a movie on just the behind the scenes of trying to make the DCU, D DCEU work, that could win an Oscar right up for reals, man. For reals. All right, let's keep going. Booyah. <laughs> like, seriously, that line right there. Nice work, Ray. That's, that totally reminds me of, um, uh, uh, that passive aggressive racism that was, that it was in that one, damn it. Why can't I remember any of these movies? Don Chile was in the movie. Um, the other guy, uh, Al Simmons was in that movie and this one dude, his wife was giving him head and then the police felt him up. Um, uh, uh, felt felt up the wife and everything and then they uh the police officer it's not it <sighs> you guys will let me know right and then that one girl got shot with the blank bullet but he thought that and then then finally the brother got killed because he was grabbing for an angel a toy angel in his pocket or something like that remember that anyways that same scene there was a whole behind the scenes thing where the producer about that all right let's keep going traffic thank you damn you're on it you're on it guys okay all right even before that line was shot fisher's agent had called warner film studio chief emerge to raise concerns about what was happening on set after Fisher arrived in Los Angeles for additional photography in summer 2017, Johns asked him to come to the D.C. offices in Burbank. When they met in a conference room, Fisher said he had apologized to Whedon for his part in the conflict. I see. Which he had done in the hope of preventing a real rupture with the D.C. team. Johns responded that having agents call merch was just not cool fisher recalls he said i consider us to be friends which he knew we're not and i just don't want you to make a bad name for yourself in the business <laughs> fisher took that as a threat john's rep says he never met a threat made a threat but told fisher that creative differences were not normally taken to the head of a film studio by an actor's agent. Hmm. Fisher was not the only Justice League star who was unhappy. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. This is the one. This is where we start to get the new stuff. All right. Damn, we. this is big, man. Okay. All right. This is big, man. All right. Here we go. <sighs> Sources say Whedon clashed with all the stars of the film, including Jeremy Irons. Scar? You got a problem with Scar, son? And once Justice League, and one Justice League star ended up taking her complaints, not only to the head of the film studio, but also to the chairman of Warner Brothers. 
Hmm, I wonder which one. Okay. A knowledgeable source says, oh, Gadot, Gadot had multiple concerns with the revised version of the film, including issues about her character being more aggressive than her character in Wonder Woman. Okay. Interesting. Especially just thinking about what we saw in the Snyder Cut. Interesting. She wanted to make the character flow from one movie to the next. Hmm. Okay. Okay. The biggest class. Oh, this one I like. Yeah. The biggest clash, sources say, came when Whedon pushed Gadot into re record to to record lines she didn't like, threatened to harm Gadot's career, and disparaged Wonder Woman director Patty Jenkins. While Fisher declines to discuss any of what transpired with Gadot, a witness on the production who later spoke to investigators, says that after one clash, Joss was so was bragging that he's had it out with Gal. He told her he's the writer and she's going to shut up and say the lines and he can make her look incredibly stupid in this movie. All right. Thank you for following Ghost. All right. A knowledgeable source says Gadot and Jenkins went to battle, culminating in a meeting with then Warner's chairman, Kevin Sujihara. Asked for comment, Gadot says in a statement, I had my issues with Whedon and Warner Brothers, handle it in a timely manner. <sighs> Three months after Justice League hit theaters, Whedon exited Warner Brother, Warner's Batgirl project. Batgirl is such an exciting project and Warner's DC such collaborative and supportive partners that it took me months to realize that I really didn't have a story, he said at the time. <laughs> nah, motherfucker. That's because the Justice League, the movie sucked um, when that first came out. And I remember people were like, do not... Do not have this dude do Batgirl. People were like, no, get this dude out of here. All right. They're like, uh, y'all remember that face plant into the titties? Um, in the theatrical one? Oh, my God. That was terrible. Okay. When Justice League opened in November 2017, the film was panned. It has a 40% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, doesn't does that really matter? at this point and grossed a disappointing 658 million worldwide <laughs> berg exited his job that december johns departed the following june but whedon was still part of the warner media universe in july 2018 a few months after he left batgirl hbo greenlighted his drama the nevers star straight to series but in November 2020, just a couple weeks before Warner Media said it had taken remedial steps uh, after its investigation into Justice League, we didn't left that project too. HBO chief Casey Boys Blois has said that there were no complaints about Whedon's behavior on that series. <laughs> this time, Whedon says said he was not up to the physical challenges of making such a huge show during a global pandemic. Warners issued a clipped, we have parted ways with Joss Whedon. Okay. After Justice League, Fisher went on to play Mahershala's Ali, yeah, Mahershala's Ali's son in the third season of True Detective which he calls a great experience. But in the coming months, he would hear fresh reports about what had gone on behind the scenes on Justice League, including the angry black man conversation and other allegations involving Johns, two individuals who worked on Sci-Fi's Krypton series, talked to Fisher about events that had taken place on the series. All right. Is that really, wait, that's him? Oh, wow. 
Isn't that the guy who's going to play Blade? That's him with, with prosthetics and stuff? Wow. That's really good. Isn't that the same guy? Mahershal Ali, right? Yeah. Wow. Okay. 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 Wow. Okay. Multiple sources tell THR that the show's creators were passionate about doing some non-traditional casting and that Rajid Jim Page would go on to become a breakout star Bridgerton, had auditioned for the role of Superman's grandfather, but Johns, who was overseeing the project, said Superman could not have a black grandfather. The creators also... The creators also wanted to make one superhero character, Adam Strange, gay or bisexual, but sources says Johns vetoed the idea. Jeff celebrates and supports LGBTQ characters, including Batwoman, who was in 2006 as was reintroduced as LGBTQ in a comic book series written co-written by Johns, says Johns rep in an email. <laughs> this rep is working overtime today. <laughs> Johns also pitched Warners on developing a TV television show around the first LGBTQ. Uh, Lee D. As for the role of Superman's grandfather, the rep says Johns believe his fans expect her to the, expected the character to look like a young Henry Cavill. <sighs> sources spoke several several sources who spoke to Fisher around this time were willing to talk to Warner's investigators. Among them was writer Nadiria Tucker, who tweeted February twenty fourth. I haven't spoken to Jeff Johns since the day on the Krypton when he tried to tell me what is and what is not a black thing. <laughs> Tucker tells THR that Johns objectified when black female characters' hairstyle was changed in scenes that took place on different days. I said, black women, we tend to change our hair frequently. It's not weird. It's a black thing, he, she says. And he said, no, it's not. <laughs> What is this, man? What is this? Wow. I didn't know. So I didn't know he was, he's actually related to Superman. All right. I didn't watch the show, but yeah. I heard it was pretty good, though. John Spokesperson says, What were standard continuity notes for a scene are being spun in a way that not that are not only personally offensive to Jeff, but to the people that know who he is, know the work he's done, and know the lives, the life he lives. As Jeff has personally first seen firsthand, the painful effects of racial stereotypes concerning hair and other cultural stereotypes have been having been married to a black woman who he was with for a decade and with his second wife, who is Asian American, as well as his son, who is mixed race. Look at this representative go. Look at this. <laughs> By late June 2020, Fisher went public with his dissatisf dissatisfaction as what he viewed the Warners in action. For their part, Warner's sources contend that Fisher was being manipulated by Snyder, who hoped to reclaim control of the DC film universe. Interesting. Fisher says that the, assert the assertion that a black man would not have his own a agency is just as racist as the conversations Warner leadership was having about Justice League reshoots. I've been underestimated at every turn during this process and that is what has led us to this point had they had taken me as seriously as they should have from the beginning they would not have made as many foolish mistakes as they did in the process snyder denies any role influencing fisher <sighs> Woof. We needed we needed 
like different acts to this article, man. This is long. This is crazy, man. All right. Tweeting footage of himself praising Whedon at a Comic-Con in 2017, Fisher wrote, I like to take a moment to forcefully retract every bit of this statement. His words earlier, his his earlier words have been based on studio supplied talking points, he says. In a subsequent tweet, he said, Whedon's onset behavior had been gross, abusive, unprofessional, completely unacceptable. He has enabled in many ways, blah, blah, blah. blah, blah, blah. Okay. Berg told Variety that it was categorical categorically untrue that we enabled any unprofessional behavior. He added that Fisher was upset about saying booyah as well as saying well-known saying of Cyborg in an anime series. Okay. Alright. Keep going. As Fisher continued to air grievances on social media in some interviews, he began to suspect that, that when he tweeted, the studio would put out an announcement to distract from his message. On July 1st, the day that F Fisher tweeted about Whedon's behavior, Deadline published an exclusive <laughs> saying Warners was making a live action Frosty the Snowman movie <laughs> with Aquaman star Jason Momoa voicing the iconic snowman. A few weeks later, Momoa pushed back on Instagram in an Instagram post. I just think it's fucked up that people re, re released that fake Frosty announcement without my permission to try to distract from Ray Fisher speaking up about the shitty way we were treated on Justice League reshoots, he wrote. So wait, he's not doing a Frosty to Snowman movie? I would like to see that. <laughs> my man! <laughs> who, who does that, though? I remember that announcement, but yo, why would you? Do, why would you just make? A, we're just just straight up make up a movie for real. <laughs> it's so stupid. Oh shit! Who's writing for Deadline? We got this covered. All right. Serious stuff went down. It needs to be investigated, and people need to be held accountable. Warners says the untitled snowman comedy remains a <laughs> That should just be the meme from now on. Everybody should just be like, release the snowman cut. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Oh my God. In early July, Fisher spoke with Walter Hamada, who had taken the reins at DC Films. He says Hamada called Joss an asshole and said, I'm just looking to get past anything to do with Justice League. Joss isn't here anymore, and I don't plan on hiring him again. But according to Fisher, Hamada says he did not believe Johns had did anything wrong. I don't know John Berg very well. I know Joss was difficult, but Jeff Ray... He's getting dragged through the mud, and I'm sure you're getting your share of hate too, Fisher responded. I'm fine with the hate because I know I'm telling the truth. He asked for an investigation. <sighs> Later that month, the studio's HR department contacted Fisher. He says he spoke with two executives for about two hours. He adds that he offered sp specific allegations of abuse behavior toward himself and others and pointed, provided the names of some of the witnesses willing to be contacted. But he was wary, co cogni cognizant that HR departments are often known to show more alliance to employers than complaining parties. He became more suspicious, he says, when witnesses started telling him they had not been contacted. Fisher requested an independent investigator and asked SAG-AFTRA to have a rep with him in the process. In mid-August, Warner HR execs told Fisher that an outside investigator had been approved, but his guard went up when the execs said, 
We really like him. We've worked with him before. Still, Fisher tweeted that this represented a massive step forward. But then a Warner's veteran told Fisher not to trust the investigation if a particular studio exec was overseeing it because that person has previously helped sweep misconduct under the rug. When he spoke to the investigator, Fisher asked how many times he had worked for a studio. He declined to answer. Fisher asked who was overseeing the inquiry, and he said and and said he would have an issue if it was the executive named by his contact. Still, uh, he, he still got no answer, feeling the situation that the situation felt pretty dodgy. Fisher went no further. On August 26th, the investigator provided a name, citing an attorney in the general counsel office. When Fisher looked at Warner Media's website, he found this individual was the only black attorney whose headshot was visible. And in fact, that lawyer had nothing to do with the investigation. She handled matters for HBO, HBO Max, TBS, and TNT. Fisher wondered if naming her had been a simple mistake or a ploy to lull him into a sense of security with the idea that she might be on the same team as me simply by the way of her being a black person. <laughs> this is fucking crazy, dude. This is wild, man. Oh my god. This is deep, dude. I'm telling you, this would be the dopest movie ever. Feeling ever more distrustful, Fisher continued to tweet, writing on September 4th that Hamada had thrown Whedon and Berg under the bus while covering for Johns. Unfortunately, it's not until I start talking about people specifically that the needle starts to move, he says. If they were going to continue to try to cover things up, I wasn't going to let that happen. Fisher then got a call from Berg, who said he was sorry that the actor had an appalling experience on Justice League and he hadn't been able to help, acknowledging that a bunch of straight white men have been running things. He had hoped that the studio would improve on that in the future. Berg said that he had spoken to the investigator at length and truthfully uh, let him know that it did mean a lot, Fisher says. I'm not beyond forgiveness when it comes to this kind of stuff. It was a very big thing for him to do. No one else in the process has reached out at all. The studio... Hold on, man. This is... Oh. <sighs> The studio, damn, we've been going at this for an hour almost? The studio, meanwhile, defended itself that day in a statement. At no time did Mr. Hamada ever throw anybody under a bus, as Mr. Fisher had falsely claimed or rendered any judgment about the Justice League production in which Mr. Hamada had no involvement. The company said Fisher had refused multiple attempts by the investigator to contact him. Fisher saw that as a smear. In early October, top Warner executives spoke with Fisher and his team, including a rep from SAG-AFTRA. Fisher reps confirmed the content of the call. When Fisher pressed the question of how the investigator had come to provide the name of an in-house attorney who had nothing to do with the inquiry, a Warner Media executive on the call responded that the investigator had just pulled the name off the internet <laughs> christy christy hallbegger head of communications at warner brother and the 
company's top inclusion officer said that the studio statement that Fisher had refused to cooperate with the investigation had been based on third hand information. The studio's communication department had been responding emotionally to Fisher's public allegations against Hamada, she said, adding that. Adding, I think they believed what they were saying was true. Fisher wondered why any studi- anyone at the studio, what, which was obs- uh, ost- ostensibly, ostensibly, hey Siri, define ostensibly. Ostensibly means, apparently or purportedly, but perhaps not actually. Okay which was ostensibly the subject of the investigation, would comment at all. Pressed by Fisher, Han Beggar declined to say who at the studio had approved the statement, but she said she was furious when she read it. I have made it 100% crystal clear to everyone in the entire Warner Brothers communication organization that not a goddamn word can be said about Ray Fisher. Han Hobbenbegger said, if I catch anyone doing that, they're fired. Fisher says he asked for an apology repeatedly in the weeks that followed. Warner Media kicked around some language that he felt he felt fell short. Ultimately, Han Beggar told Fisher, I don't think that if people said something they believed was true, that there's an apology needed. After the studio put out the statement accusing him of not cooperating, what Fisher calls the hit piece, he asked for another investigator. Warner Media agreed to bring Forrest, who they told him had handled the investigation. Thank you for uh, following. Uh, by the way, saying. Um, oh my god, this is crazy. Okay, Forrest. Fisher was... Uh, uh, Oh, wait, uh, who they had handled the investigation of ousted CEO Sujihara. Fisher was initially optimistic, but he said, but he says he again turned wary when Forrest, who is white, led with the fact that she was an Obama appointee. Still, Fisher was somewhat optimistic because he believed Forrest's previous Sujihara investigation had exposed the leg's misconduct. That's true because he had a like. Uh, he was having an affair or something. But she told him that she hadn't completed that inquiry before Sujihara left. Instead, he left after THR published an article about his entanglement with inspiring actress Charlotte Kirk. Damn. Yeah, who was he banging on the side? Hold on, let's take a look here. Hello. All right, Kevin. All right, Kevin. I don't know, though. Not my, not my type, but yeah, you know. Okay. Okay, man. All right. Initially, Fisher was the forest. Initially, Forrest was told Forrest. Initially, Fisher was told Forrest would work alongside the original investigator. He objected, and the original investigator withdrew. In December, Fisher says that he and his SAG after F had a final conversation with Forrest during which she said remedial action had been taken, some of which she said Fisher had probably seen, but she was not explicit. She said further remedial action would be taken, but again did not offer specifics. When she told Fisher she did not find evidence of racial animus, Warner Chair. Warner Brothers chairman Ann Sarnoff said in a recent interview that the investigator found the cuts made in the Joss Whedon version of Justice League were not racially motivated, but Forrest didn't say that publicly. Two, Fisher, the information Forrest shared was so limited that it seemed the purpose was clear. She was only authorized by Warner Media to attempt to explain away anything to do with race. Warner's maintains it as complete confidence in the investigation process and her conclusions. On December 11th, Warners issued a statement saying the investigation was finished and what Fisher calls a Friday night news dump. 
Witnesses contacted him asking what happened, but he has no answers. He had no answers. A week later, he pressed Han Beger and other execs for more information. They asked him to provide names of anyone who had told him that they hadn't gotten closure. Fisher said he would not provide witnesses. In February, he tweeted that Hamada was the most dangerous kind of enabler who had shown that he would blindly cover for his colleagues and he had worked with the studio to destroy a black man's credibility and publicly delegitimize a very serious investigation with lies in the press. Fisher says he was referring to the September statement that Fisher had refused to cooperate in the investigation, which he feels Hamada must have known about in advance. The company responded with a statement from Forrest saying Hamada was credible and forthcoming and did nothing that impeded or interfered with the company's investigation. Fisher believes this missed the bigger picture. While he accused Hamada of undermining and tampering with the investigations in a series of tweets, he says this this these were specifically in reference to the conversation that he had with Hamada in which the executive tried to dissuade Fisher from pursuing his grievances against Johns. Fisher does not, he says, believe that Hamada otherwise actively tried to interfere with the investigation. Sources at the studio however point to Fisher's tweets as evidence. <laughs> oh, I can't do this. Thank you, Eric, for following. Um Evidence of shifting grudges and lack of credibility. Okay. Before things... Oh, oh, we're finally here. We're finally here. This is it. This is the it's the final stretch chair. Final stretch. Before things had gone sour, Fisher was expected to play a supporting role as Cyborg in the planned movie, The Flash. In June 2020, Fisher says... He had a call with director Andy Musetti that seemed positive, but the discussion hit a snag when Warner's framed a two-week shoot as a cameo, offering only a fraction of what Fisher says he should have been paid for reappearing as Cyborg. By late September, he was upset by press reports that he was demanding to double his pay. Ultimately, the studio removed cy the cyborg role from the movie, citing a December 30th tweet. The studio said, given his statement that Mr. Fisher will not participate in any film associated with Mr. Hamada, our production is now moving on. Fisher says he wasn't surprised. When I first spoke up, I assumed there was no way these guys would allow me to do my job in peace, he says. Now working on the ABC anthology series, Women of the Movement, Fisher says he knew the struggle could be costly. I'm not so indebted to Hollywood that I haven't been willing to put myself out there, he says. I don't believe some of these people are fit for positions of leadership, says Fisher, who explains he's not looking for anyone to be fired. I don't want them excommunicated from Hollywood, but I don't think that they should be in charge of the hiring and firing of other people. Fisher knows he's not going to win that battle, but he feels a point has been made. If I can't get accountability, he says, at least I can make people aware of who they're dealing with. Wow. <sighs> that is indeed some good tea well there you have it folks uh we finally got what he promised he came he delivered man that was an hour's ex worth of exposure here all right guys go ahead just just type up right now just uh 
just mess go ahead and uh let me know what you think just type whatever your your thoughts are right now i'm not gonna really i don't think i'm i'm so i'm not gonna respond to everything but go ahead and just type what you're thinking right now so you can get it in this youtube video um this is rough man this is really rough um you know it's uh it's it's discouraging it's discouraging i think for anybody that like i i always say the hardest thing the hardest thing it's so hard to be a dc fan and seeing this kind of stuff going on you know um yeah it would be a good four hour movie it's it's so heartbreaking and you know i honestly speaking i don't i don't necessarily agree with everything ray is saying in terms of his portrayal of cyborg but i do respect the fact that you know i get his point in the fact that what he signed up for the cyborg that he signed up for in the type of pitch that he was given by Zack Snyder is not what he wanted to be portrayed as um, in the final product of the theatrical one. So I get that point. I definitely get that point. Um, and I, I'm not agreeing completely with what, like, it's just so messy. It's so bad of everything that uh, behind the scenes, this hearing what's been going on and like some of the cover-ups and such it's 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 crazy i agree with you that uh there definitely needs to be a complete overhaul of wb but i'm like where where does that start you know what i'm saying like like where 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 like you know and of wb from the top down but you know you know one you know it's, it's interesting because it's like one of the reasons kevin feige is so good at what he does is the fact that he started with stuff that nobody wanted you know it wasn't an overnight success kevin feige worked at sony um Kevin Feige worked at Sony for quite some time. Uh, he, I think he actually worked on some of those Spider-Man movies or something. And he would like, they, you know, Sony ain't out of the woods. Sony isn't, you know, all of these old time studios have some sort of dirt on them. Uh, there's a whole story about how one of the women, uh, the head, uh, I forgot her name, threw a sandwich at Kevin, Kevin Feige when they were talking about different ideas or something like there's a, just a bunch of dicks in Hollywood. I mean, and that's Hollywood. That's the thing, you know, um, it's crazy like that. Uh, and so, Anne over in Warner brothers side of things mentioned that Jim Lee is the Kevin Feige of DC films. And I'm like, to what extent though? I don't think so there i i absolutely not you know absolutely not so it's like uh he might you know he has a say in some of the matters but he doesn't have the final say and that's you know if like personally personally if we're if it were up to me if it were up to me flashpoint the art the flash movie that's coming up the f uh the flash movie that's coming up would be basically everybody's final goodbye like this is it like y'all get to say goodbye to all y'all universes we're restarting everything but on top of that symbolically that's also going to be the goodbye of um 
all of these like all of these people behind the scenes i'm talking about all of them man uh walt walter amada john anybody anybody that's involved everybody is done then i'd take i take jeff john no i take jim lee i take jim lee Somebody related to Kevin Feige. <laughs> Somebody Kevin Feige can vouch for, you know. And I'd bring in Bruce Tim. I'd bring in Bruce Tim. I'd bring in Paul Dini as producers. And I'd completely restart the entire universe based on the Bruce Tim universe like that. And that's it. Nope. No Matt Reeves. As much as I love Matt Reeves. Nah. Not yet. I don't I don't want anybody I don't want any I don't want any director's take on any of this right now. Not yet. Not yet. But I'd have all these people as strong consultants. That have already established, and uh, I honestly would take more opinions from all the animated people, the people that have made animated stories over the line, and then get directors that can understand the points of those, of why those stories work so well, and then streamline it that way. That's the way I would do it. Um... Because this is just not working, man. What they're... <laughs> this, it's, it's still so broken. This is crazy. We're just... The only DC movies we're ever going to have at some point is basically Batman. It's like... This is, this is crazy, man. Um, yep. Then, on the, on the council... So here, here's what the council of Warner Brothers is going to be. It's going to be the new, we're going to be, it's going to be like the goddamn NWO, where it's going to be the new world order, baby. It's going to be Jim Lee. It's going to be Bruce Tim. It's going to be Aka Sun. It's going to be Paul Dini. It's going to be Trey from Married to the Gaming. I'm sorry, Married to the Real. <laughs> and then on the council... On the council of consultants, I'm not saying executive producers, or I'm just council of consultants, council of consultants, we're going to have Matt Reeves, Christopher Nolan, Tyrone Magnus, <laughs> fine, fuck it, Eric from Blind Wave, we'll put him on there, council of consultants, you know, all right? And, um, and Twitter, Twi Twi Twitter will be on there, but they're only going to have like a 5% say in the council of consultants. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's the new DC y'all. That's the new DC films in the Akaverse. That's how we're doing it. Executive. Remember executive producers is Akasan, Jim Lee, Bruce, Tim, Paul Dini and Trey from married to the real. We're bringing in it because, you know, we need more black people in here, obviously. That's the only way we're getting Ray to come back. When he finds out Akasan, Grace Randolph, who's somebody banned, you're banned, Grace Randolph, please. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Speaking of which, though, let's let's bring in, let's bring in Homegirl, the uh, director of Birds of Prey. Let's just bring her back. That's a good idea. Yeah. Just to stick it to uh, Grace Randolph. <laughs> well, well, well. Oh, God. I'm tired, y'all. Um, this was a long one, and I appreciate you guys hanging out with me on this one. Um, uh, it's, it's just disappointing. Overall, it's just all disappointing to hear about all of this that's going on. Um, I'm glad. The one thing I'm glad about is the fact that uh, a few things I'm glad about. Ray Fisher got we got to see ray fisher's real story the real cyborg in the snyder cut ray fisher is still working in hollywood that's another thing 
I think that's important. He may never work with Warner Brothers again, but at least he has some work in Disney. They got him for Disney. What could Ray Fisher do in the Marvel world? Is there is there room for him in the Marvel world? Or does Image need to step up and start making movies? I feel like we need we do need another company out there like Image to start making movies. What the hell's going on with Spawn? Ooh, should he play Spawn? The next Al Simmons, Ray Fisher? Brother Brother Voodoo. Good call, good call. I could see that, you know. Um I don't know. I don't know. But I'm glad that he's still working. Uh as I've mentioned before, he uh he approached me in Japan. Um at first I thought he was going to say something about me. He was like, yeah, man, I know you. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. But, um, nah, he was real nice. And then we talked about My Hero Academia. Um, oh, man, that'd be great if he was actually in a My Hero Academia movie. That'd be cool. I need to message him about that. The new season finally started. Um, but, yeah, Blue Marvel. There you go. Black Cap. Yeah. Uh, but I'm glad he's still working. I'm glad the Snyder Cut was released so we could see Cyborg's true story here, or the way he wanted to have it portrayed. I'm just disappointed in the direction all of this is going. Um, and I hope, I really hope that, um, the at least with the Batman, will be okay. I feel like the Batman is going to be the least controversial controversial out of all of this but i still feel like the flash movie is gonna be we're going to still see remains of this style of what's going on um further dc movies you know we still got black adam you know i feel we i still feel it's a rough road ahead but i hope that there will be there I just, I just want this to be better. That's all. We deserve better. Thank you for following DT. Appreciate that. Um, it's messy, but I just want all of this to be better. Red Red Nation, stand up, speak up here over, over there on YouTube. Let me know what you guys think. Thank you for hanging out. This was a long one. I hope it was worth it. And, um, you know, let's just, let's really hope for the best. I, I feel like this article is basically Ray Fisher- giving closure um and pro uh on delivering with what he um on what he promised basically is after his indian a uh uh was over and done with he could say what he needed to say and i think that's more than enough i think um there really won't be any changes after this. I'm pretty sure Warner has already kind of gone the direction they're going um, and what they want to do. And it's so messy that I think that's the biggest problem. It's just so messy that like what can be resolved? How can this re how can this be resolved anymore? Ray already kind of made it kind of clear that you know, there may not really be a good answer for any of this. You know, cancel, cancel culture tells us that we should just fire people over there. But it's kind of just like, you know, a lot of this really is just, I wouldn't say a one-sided opinion, but it's just hearing different parts of the argument. But you know what? That's also Hollywood at the same time. I just, I mentioned it earlier and I forgot the name of the movie already, but there is a scene like that where you're just talking about it and you know it's like no no we're gonna write it we're gonna write it out and you're like oh is there a problem is there a problem like that so you know that's hollywood in general and this exposure is good because it helps try to change things um you know but there's also running that risk of uh, creativity as well uh being stifled and sometimes through controversy and through that chaos, you do create something sort of beautiful. Somebody mentioned it earlier about the uh, situation with um, Matt Reeves saying he didn't want to work with Rob 
Robert Pattinson after this movie because one of them, you know, Matt Reeves is a crazy workaholic and he does take after take after take, right? Um, then, um, you know, but that's kind of the way to, uh, Matt has always been like that with the the Apes movies and things like that. So, uh, and you know, that may be one of the reasons one, that's why his movies are that good. So it's, it's, it's really messy y'all. Um, I don't think we've, I don't want to say, I don't think we should be taking sides because I don't know if there's necessarily a side to a proper side to take in any of this, just raging against the WB machine is that really going to help? Is that really going to fix things? I don't know. I I don't know. If anybody has an answer, honestly, if anybody has an answer other than fire everybody, I don't, because th that's not really like a legit answer, right? Um, if anybody has like some sort of a better idea, I would love to hear it because um, I just, I just want to like, like Trey was mentioning a few weeks ago, like, bro, what are we talking about here? Like, what are we talking? What are we doing here? We're talking about movies. We're trying to like, let's talk about, we're talking about comic books, right? It shouldn't be this messy. It should have never been this messy. But you're living in a fucking dream world. Exactly. Snyder. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. Zach. You're right. <sighs> But you're living in a fucking dream world. You're right, man. You're right. You're right. My fault. <laughs>